And I now ask um, all the presenters here today to join on the table at the, at the top. And can I now introduce our discussant, Jesse Lastonen, who will uh, give some reflections on the presentations so far. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, David, and thanks for the very insightful presentation. So uh, I'd like to start by expanding upon something that David mentioned in the introduction. I think Prince also mentioned, which is uh, say a little bit more about the Southmont policy notes. Uh, so, like mentioned, since 2015, when the Southmont project was started at UNU Wide Earth, uh, kind of one fundamental piece of the project has been delivering these three-day training events uh, to local participants in the respective countries, covering the models, uh, covering an introduction to tax benefit microsimulation modeling in general. And one of the challenges with these uh, training events earlier has been kind of to trying to keep participants engaged after, after each training um, uh, and between training events which are usually around one year apart. So we wouldn't want the attendees of these events simply to forget about the, the models uh, for a year after hopefully attending the next event. And uh, these policy notes we, which you've seen today, and there are many others as well, they're kind of an innovation to help address this issue. So to have the participants to work actively uh, on the models also after each, each training event. Uh, and it's not just a additional engagement. Uh, as we saw from the presentations, the policy notes also offer us a way to kind of ask the right questions, questions that the local experts know are uh, important to their countries. Uh, so in these training events, which we now actually call retreats, as I think Prince also mentioned, uh, we asked the participants to come up with policy ideas, policy evalu evaluation ideas, where A, uh, you can actually use tax benefit microsimulation models to evaluate them, and B, uh, notes that address questions that are actually important to the local policy debates uh, in each country. Uh, so the participants start the work in the, in the retreat and then continue uh, working on the, on the policy notes uh, for the coming months after the, after the retreat, with the help of uh, myself and others at Wider, SASPRI, and of course the national teams uh, from which we have representatives here uh, in the panel. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it's a great initiative, and as you've seen, it's a very interesting mixture of, of notes uh, that cover a range of policy reforms and their effects on public spending, poverty uh, and inequality, among other things. Uh, so I thought I'd mention a few things that I think uh, tie these notes together a little bit. So I think one common thread that comes up quite a bit is uh, uh, targeting. So not, surpri not surprisingly, we've seen that if you really want to reduce poverty in a country, you need to target the poor. Uh, similarly, if you want to improve the welfare of uh, self-employed women or, or orphan children or older people, you should really target those groups uh, in most cases. And I think these studies really highlight uh, how policy goals can be achieved cost-effectively when targeting is done, done in a proper way. So you have you know, more per capita support for the target group. You can use less resources overall. And it's also possible to design the benefits more often to promote desired behavioral, uh, behaviors like school attendance in the case of uh, one of the Vietnamese briefs. Of course, there are some caveats or counter arguments to just using these narrow uh, targeted benefits, like the general difficulty in identifying a small group of beneficiaries. Uh, targeted benefits can also be harder to administer, uh, sometimes politically uh, less feasible, and so on. So there are these caveats that we also need to keep in mind when thinking about these benefits. Uh, another point that is relevant to the topic of the conference is that even if the targeting is successful, any effective social protection measure still requires sufficient uh, funding, sufficient revenues raised to, to fund it. So uh, we saw, for instance, from the Mozambique note that increasing the benefit amounts and uh, the coverage uh, amounts of the BSSP policy, it's, it can reduce poverty quite substantially. Same with the uh, uh, orphan gas transfer in Tanzania. Uh, some of the model benefits had a very large impact on poverty reduction in the country. But at the same time, the cost implications are, are quite noticeable uh, in those cases. And this ties to what I would call win-win reforms, where changes in tax benefit arrangements actually uh, lead to reductions in poverty and inequality without uh, requiring additional public spending on net or even increasing revenues uh, on net terms. So as we saw in the note from Ghana, for instance, the focus was on 
uh, streamlining the little bit problematic education support policy and reallocating these additional resources to the uh, kind of more cost-effective uh, old age benefit. And one of the Vietnamese notes in turn showed how uh, a new education-related benefit to minority children could be fully funded by uh, income tax adjustments. Uh, so these are some of the examples of these, uh, these type of policies that allowed for both, uh, allowed for reducing poverty in a revenue neutral manner. And the Zambian case was also uh, similar, not fully revenue neutral, but basically also had the goal of using public resources kind of more effectively to re reduce uh, poverty uh, and inequality. And uh, identifying these win-win situations, basically hypothetical reforms uh, that are favorable both from budgetary point of view, but also distributional point of view. I think this is where tax benefit microsimulation modeling really shines. And it's also where I think policymakers would benefit most from the met methodology. Um, so yeah, finally, just another kind of a policy related point, but also a techni po technical point, uh, which is about different scenarios you've seen in uh, many of these uh, policy notes. So. Uh, in one of the, well, from a policy maker's point of view, you want to have policy options that you can easily compare against each other. Uh, there should be something that uh, would make them easily comparable. And uh, in one of the Vietnamese notes, for instance, uh, the one with the benefit to self-employed women, the study compared three scenarios that differed by their targeting and benefit amounts, but the total budget in each case was exactly the same. So. This makes it really easy for policymakers to kind of pick and choose based on their goals which uh, reform would, bene would be the most favorable. So this is something I think we should uh, strive to do in this analysis uh, in most cases, simply because it makes it uh, easy to compare the, the findings. Um, so yeah, I think I'll leave it at that uh, and uh, hand it back over to David and leave the rest of questions to the floor. So thank you. Thank you, yes, a. Before we open up the questions to the floor, can I ask any of the speakers so far whether they'd like to respond to any of the points that yes, a has just raised? I think uh, yes, a kind of uh, not really raised question, but uh, sort of argumented what has been done uh, across this country and try to show again what we've been emphasizing that uh, this particular model can be really very useful in trying to translate what people see at the macro level. People talk about the economic growth, and those macro variables, but they don't see what is happening on the ground. So you see, it's important that we are able to show to the policymaker, especially the government people that look, all these struggle and efforts to reduce inequality and poverty can be really achieved with exactly evidence-based scenarios. And I think this is what this has been trying to say. And I think it uh, helped a lot to have something on the table to say, look, we talk about vulnerable. In Tanzania, for example, based on this task model we have done universal health coverage, there has been a big debate, and that helped a, lo a lot to clear and give insights. There have been issues about the vulnerable individuals in the households, the child grants, and now we've done this often. And people talk about what will be the impact of introducing different subsidies. And there are quite a number of other areas we are going to look at, especially when they introduce the, the fees. I mean, taxes of fees on communication, plus the one on the, I can't remember, we call TOZO. There is in communication, when you, use it, when you call somebody, and the, the other also taxes as well, or fees. So there are quite a lot, this model which you are capable of doing, to try to bring an evidence on the table of what will be the impact in one sense when it comes to welfare and inequality, what that will cost government resource, whether it's a sort of exempt tax or using a public fund, but more so the kind of beneficiaries and the bit criteria. So I think this has tried to summarize what has been, been doing. And I really thank you very much, you know, to come with this innovation of uh, do a retreat where people come with a policy brief. Because these government people are very busy. While they're there after a meeting, they're going back. So if you tell them in advance, you people from Social Protection Unit, what do you think is important? You people from the Ministry of Agriculture, what do you think is important? Then they come with the idea. Then you work with them. They see example, they do scenarios. I think that's helped a lot. Maybe that is to support what this has been said. 
All right, just, just to add a few words. Uh, yes, he mentioned, uh, thank you, and you, and you mentioned uh, targeting as, as one of the key challenges when it comes to suggesting policy reforms. And that is what makes this uh, particular reform we are suggesting, the hypothetical case we are suggesting in Ghana, quite unique. Because then the government doesn't have to disturb it itself with worrying about issues of uh, seeing to it that the targeting is quite proper. Because with this reform, it, it, it kind of, uh, on its own, delineates the poor from, the, from those, who are actual, those who can actually pay and are willing to pay. So then the government takes up just the day cost. Then those who are willing to pay for the residential moves on to pay, and no one is discriminated against. Right. So this is, this is also a unique way to go around the, the targeting issues, because currently there are suggestions about government properly targeting and focusing on those who actually need these uh, cost, uh, the fee rebates and those who actually need this benefit. But the challenge has been how to target on the government side. And I think this can be a quasi-targeting strategy that can be adopted by the government. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just to concur with uh, the other speakers, I'd like to speak uh, also additionally about another aspect. Um, obviously, yes, I mentioned some of the important things that we're able to do. Uh, but also as a member of the team working on the model, uh, the policy notes and the policy sol solutions also help us as teams uh, working on the model to also think about some of the limitations of the model, what else can we do to improve the model, what sort of data can we look for. Uh, because as we discuss uh, these various ideas, we then also are able to realize that the model has limitations. There are certain data limitations. And I think this process has been helpful for us also as teams to understand how else can we make this model work. What sort of questions are being asked? What policy questions are being asked that we might have challenges answering? And so how do we work to improve that model? What other pieces of data can we look at? How can we find these data pieces and put them into the model so that we basically help and improve to understand um, some of these uh, problems? For example, one of the challenges we had is uh, when we looked at the, the, the policy note that we prepared, we were not able to model um, the administration costs which are quite huge. And so the model or the presentation or results will basically show that uh, this change will be as a result of, this, this, this reform will result in additional costs. But in reality, we know that the savings on the administrative costs, which we do not model uh, in, the, in the model, are far higher. And so actually, even with the new reform and the additional funding, in reality, the government might not be able to, in, the government will not need to spend additional money. So it's sort of those challenges that we also face that help us to think about how best we can improve and work on the model so that uh, we ensure that our results are actually more effective and more convincing for the policymakers. Thank you. So uh, I just want to add some few words uh, for the case of Vietnam. And I think that the tax policy, uh, the tax poli the reforms of tax policy is always controversial, not only in Vietnam, but also in other countries. So uh, the micro simulation comes from the household level. So it can like, be a good evidence base uh, for convincing the government to uh, include some kind of the uh, evidence for the government to think of the policy adjustment. So, uh, for example, in, my, uh, in the case of Vietnam, we have some, uh, some recent uh, reforms of the tax uh, management system. So one of that is like the personal income tax that I have already presented. Or uh, in one way is that the, the forthcoming study on the adjusting excise tax on tobacco is quite controversial. Uh, and it has been last quite a long time ago, five, six years ago. Um, in one way, the producers, they want to um, promote their productions, and they want, uh, and in, in other side, the government want to uh, increase the revenue. So uh, what to do with, with the VN mode or the micro simulation is that we provide the evidence base so that to have some justification as well as convincing for the government. Uh, through some of the very specific uh, 
programs, specific policy, or very specific amount that can be uh, like evidenced. Thank you, Ming. Thank you very everybody. Okay, we, we started slightly late, so I hope you don't mind if we continue for about another 10 minutes. Can I ask um, questions from the floor and whether we have any questions online? Not yet. Questions from the floor. We have one. Have we any more? Should we take two, take two questions if we've got them? Okay, just a gentleman here first then, please. Could you introduce yourself, say where you're from, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm Ano Chinfwembe from the Zambia Revenue Authority, that is Zambia. So I'm not sure if it's more of a question or a comment, but uh, uh, great presentations, and I think uh, it's, it's great research, obviously, in what we're trying to look at, uh, social welfare and uh, reducing poverty. But obviously, when you look at the flip side of the coin, there's an issue of uh, raising those uh, the revenues. And uh, obviously, you can't just rely on grants. There's the taxation aspect. And if we take an example of a country like where we are in Norway, the rate of personal income tax is quite high. So those are factors that would probably need to be considered when we look at, when we talk about the social benefits, we look at the flip side of the coin on how it will affect the taxation of the individuals in those countries. So now, this also takes me into the targeted groups. My thought around this, uh, with Ghana, I think because of the targeted uh, groups, it's something that works well. But when you look at uh, probably Tanzania, I was thinking around, instead of looking at providing cash to the households, uh, are you able to convert that into another form of benefit, pro proposing maybe food, foodstuffs, for example, maybe rice, a bag of rice, because if you are going to provide cash to a household that is looking after an orphan, chances are that that person might not actually benefit from that actual resource that is being taken to that. So my thoughts were around that. If in, in the research probably there's a way in which you can move the element of the cash transfer for the orphans, especially children, instead of giving the, the people that are taking care of them that actual cash, try to find ways in which you can support them. Maybe give them uniform for schools or pay for their school fees, do that actual benefit instead of just giving them cash. And on a lighter note, you might find that uh, relatives are taking out each other so that they benefit from the resource. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, for that question. Before we uh, ask the p panel to answer that, there's a lady over there that has a question as well. Thank you. Um, I'm Lillian Prestier from NORAD. And thank you for great presentations and uh, a great variety of uh, examples that were really um, interesting to listen to. Um, so I wanted to ask about the, uh, specifically the Zambia case, but a bit general, where uh, you compare uh, a policy that is related to distributing inputs versus cash. I mean, I think it's a bit... Um, uh, you know, there, this will <laughs> create quite a bit of interest, I think, because cash is a little bit uh, in time now. But I was wondering if, uh, when making policy recommendations, whether you then also have to consider effects of, you know, introducing cash instead of inputs when it comes to um, the access to these inputs for people who get cash instead. I mean, will it raise the price, or what will happen uh, to that? Um, yeah, so that was uh, one question, whether you need then to follow up, or, or if you can, I don't know if it is possible to capture it. Um, and the other question was uh, how, um, more generally to the model, how uh, the alternative uh, uh, policies are selected. Is it selected together with the government to, you know, to, to choose uh, alternatives that are um, um, doable or desirable from the government side? Um, or is it more kind of based on your research design? Yeah, or both maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much for those two questions. Can I suggest that, um, Miselo, do you want to take the question about FISP first, as that's quite specific, and then the questions around, uh, debates around the food packages versus cash, and the, the issue in the process of policy reform selection is maybe a broader discussion for the panel. Okay, great. Um, 
Yeah, so obviously um, it's quite interesting that we compare two programs. So firstly, the social cash transfer program in Zambia, which, is, which provides cash to households, has also been running for around the same period, uh, also around two decades. And this is delivered in cash to households. Um, maybe the issues would be the difference in what the purpose is. So for example, uh, the cash transfer is then meant to support the household in terms of it meeting food costs and other living costs, so whatever it is that the household needs to pay for. Whereas um, for the inputs, they are very specific and they are farming inputs, so they, they, re they receive them in kind. However, the challenge is, and why we looked at this particular program, is these inputs firstly are not produced locally in Zambia, so uh, these are imported inputs, uh, fertilizers imported, and in the last two or three years, the price has been significantly high because of uh, what has been happening in Ukraine. So it's meant also that government has even had to spend far much higher. Um, there are other issues also outside the inputs that we consider for the agriculture sector. I think one of the concerns from policymakers is what happens to nutrition, what happens to food production. Uh, one of the things that we look at, though not considered in the model, uh, at the point of, of, of selecting these policy reforms, is we also consider what are the productivity levels. If you look at rural households in Zambia that are already receiving uh, these inputs for farming, 30% of rural households in Zambia are actually net buyers of maize because the inputs largely go into maize production. So despite government giving inputs to produce maize, 30% of these rural households actually end up buying maize, meaning in terms of productivity, there is nothing uh, that's happening on the ground. So those are also some of the concerns uh, that we consider. So ideally, instead of pushing these households to produce maize, we're basically saying, can we give them a cash grant that they can then use to buy food rather than uh, production of maize, which they might not be so good at? Thank you. Yes, uh, let me attempt to attempt the three questions quickly as fast as there is concern, then my friend will help as well. So I, I understand that there is a tax fatigue and in our governments, they always tax those who are formerly, which is very bad. So this model allowed to look for source other than tax. And when we are doing, for example, universal earth coverage, we have so many other sources outside the tax system. It's not all about doing tax swaps. So we went to the livestock market. We assume if every, for a single, let's say, cattle or a goat, you take this amount. You go to a tourism, there are quite a number of transactions there you take a certain amount. You go to airport, assuming that the people are traveling are middle class and they, they afford a lot of things. So we have a range of issues where we can generate a big sum. For the case of Zanzib, it was even interesting because during these negotiations, they talk so much about zakat. And the zakat, I think, is in, like what is it, teeth in Christian. And the Muslim Zanzib were 99.9%. They give a lot in their institution. And they say, they give, I think, 2.5%. And that amount of money is significant. The issue was about the, the mechanism through which that can be turned around to be sort of social protections. It's done partly in Nigeria, Southern Sudan, most of these Arabic countries, and it ends a lot of innings. It's not only about tax. And the, in Tanzania or Kenya or other areas, there is, they say sin tax, the casino and whatever. So there are so many others other than the former one. It all depends how you implement. And this brings me to the second uh, bit. I mean, uh, shall we give direct money to the parents who may end up alcoholic or do other things, or should we have uh, other approach? And in the, most of this uh, transfer, there are program other than giving direct the money, condition, condition on attending school, condition on attending clinic, or the package could have been uh, in the hospital, for example, maternity grants and the supermarket where you only get in kindly, but the money has already been paid there. So there could be many approaches to ensure that the targeted orphan child or vulnerable or poor household or whatever, they really get the money. I think that's going to be done and it's about, it's about how you, you organize and plan that one. And the last one was about, I can't remember. Live here. Um, should we, well, should we? Can I ask whether um, Prince and Min would like to respond to the question, the lady's question about the process through which policy reforms have been selected? 
Yes, maybe a bit on that one. Like in your case, you see, I just present it on behalf of the government people. And this one is a, a good case because this is a good, this is a group what was referred as uh, intersectoral, multisectoral short protections, where is under Prime Minister office as heading that, but people come from Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Health, some government de departments, the TASAF, and uh, the vulnerability departments in Prime Minister. So, you see them, they engage, they came with the ideas. We all organize, think through whether it can be done within the model. And uh, we let them go with some support from, uh, some support from UNIDA, and they come up with the policy. So this policy is really by MDAs, means uh, government, means department and agents who came together under the training for the case of uh, the, the one for Tanzania. That said, I don't think there's much to add from Ghana because the, the, the strategy to selecting policies is basically the same. So we don't impose any policy prescription on them. It's the participants who, who, have, who, who have diverse background who come up with these policy suggestions. And our role is just to, to help them see whether the model can help address the questions they have in terms of policy. And then essentially that helped because they come from a point of need that okay, the government or the civil society institution is interested in knowing ABC about tax social assistance. How does GAMOT help? Then we help them shape things and then put things up. All right. Yeah, so for, for the case of Vietnam, we uh, uh, expressly first going to talk about the upcoming uh, study first. So on the excise tax on tobacco, uh, the policy is being uh, promoted by uh, the, the government on the tax reform system. So we involve in a lot of uh, debate and also involve in a lot of dialogue with the, the policy makers and also the other stakeholders of the industries. We found some of the scenarios that is being discussed or being or maybe included in the proposal to the government. So uh, by using the model, we can have some better evidence or better uh, justifications for the government to see that if you change that kind of policy, you can get how much and how much come to the uh, household, how much come to the production and how much come to others, different stakeholder. So that is like the real policy reform. So not only in like the, the policy notes, uh, the two other policy notes is also comes from the ideas of the uh, participants uh, from the training retreats. And, uh, but actually it's still based on the very uh, practical uh, issues in Vietnam uh, that you, you have not yet touched upon a certain target group that need to be like, uh, have more benefit. Yeah, thank you. A quick one. Okay. I'll just finally also add that these policies from, from, from particularly from Ghana are often policies where there's much talk about it in, in normative talk, right, without facts. So these uh, individuals are often interested in how do we get facts to contribute to this discussion. Right, so currently ongoing, free SHS is a big talk in Ghana now, but it's all being okay out of value judgments. So this helps them add some figures, so some uh, statistical basis to the suggested reforms. Right. Thank you very much. So we've just about reached time now, in fact just gone over. From my side, I'd just quickly reflect to my three main reflections, I think, both from the sessions today, but also from my, you know, my years of work on this program with colleagues here and around the world. Firstly, I mean, the conference this week, we've heard a lot about the importance of um, simulating tax and tax reforms for generating revenue. Uh, hopefully you'll, see, you'll have seen today that also there's a lot of value in, in simulating the effects of benefit reforms in conjunction potentially with tax reforms for tackling poverty and inequality across the global south. I hope you'll agree with me that um, the models that you've seen presented today demonstrate a high degree of flexibility. We've heard about policy notes on issues around low-income women, children in schools, 
orphans, farmers, labour-constrained households. There's been work around the effect of the impact of COVID on uh, incomes and distributions. So these models have a great deal of flexibility, both are modelling the effects and tax systems, but also benefits. And finally, um, a theme that has been raised a number of times over the last few days um, is the, the importance of collaboration. And I think this is a real strength of the Southpod programme in that there's no way we could have reached the, the point we are now without really strong bonds and, and working relationships between our local experts on the ground in these countries, wider ourselves, SASPRI, other academic institutions, but also really importantly, the participants in the, in the training courses, the people who are employed in the ministries, who actually know on a day-to-day -day basis what these policy needs are, which we can hopefully help to support them in developing this evidence base. So I'd like to thank everyone who's come today to watch. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody on, online. And finally, I'd like to thank our, our speakers and our discussants.